What child is this? Yes. Yes. That is the question. That, that has always been the question. What child is this? That, that, that single question was the driving force behind our lengthy journey. We had to figure out what child this is. And I know. My friends, we have been called wise by many of the people we encountered along our journey, if even for a brief moment. <laughs> I, I hesitate to, to give much credence to their judgment. But it is known, or it should be known, that knowledge is acquired by keeping one's eyes open and mouth shut. So, may I suggest that you keep your mouths closed and your ears open, and I will, to the best of my ability, answer your question as clear as I can. One, we did not stumble upon this child. No, we found a needle in a haystack. And how did we find this needle? We followed the star. I know. To many, that would be considered a fool's errand, but we are no fools. No, that star was moved by some unseen force. And who moves stars but God? Two, we encountered that corrupt king. That king wanted us to find the child so that he could worship the child. My friends, do kings worship babies? No. Kings defend their thrones. And that king, that king, that Herod, is a ruthless and cruel despot. It does not take a wise man to discern that. And that king felt that this child was a threat. And mark my words, that child is a threat to all who are cruel and ruthless. And three, I don't have words for three. My entire life I have searched. And yet it was always just beyond the horizon of my knowing. Until, in an instant, I crossed a threshold and there it was. That father, that mother, that star, the child. It was all there. All my searching, all my studying, it was all right there. All in that child. How could I not worship him? I need search no more. Over these five Sundays of Advent leading up to and through Christmas Day, we have been exploring the Christmas story through the eyes of some of the key people involved in that very first Christmas. In a series that I've entitled Portraits of Christmas, we began with a portrait of humility, Mary, and then we studied a portrait of obedience, Joseph, and last Sunday we looked at a portrait of joy, the shepherds. Portraits of Christmas, today's fourth lesson, focuses on a portrait of seeking the wise men. 
Whatever else we may learn from these magi, certainly their story is one of searching, looking, pursuing, hunting, chasing, tracking. Yes, I believe that the most outstanding quality that marked the wise men's lives was seeking. I think if we take a fresh look at this story this morning, we might be surprised to learn a few things that we didn't know before. So let's begin by looking at the Scripture together. Earlier I asked you to turn with me in your Bible to Matthew 2, so let's work our way through these 12 verses together. Beginning with verses 1 and 2, follow along in your Bible. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And so it was after Jesus was born, during the time of King Herod, I always hate to disappoint all of you nativity scene lovers, but the fact is the wise men did not come to the stable or the manger. As a matter of fact, as we put together the account here in Matthew chapter 2 with the account of Jesus' birth in Luke 2, we discover that it was many months after Jesus' birth, most likely 18 to 24 months, that these wise men arrived in the city of Jerusalem. And those of you that know me well know that I have a reputation for sabotaging other people's nativity scenes. <clears throat> In fact, if I come to your house and find wise men around your stable or manger, I will most likely secretly move them to another room in your house. Some of you have experienced that. <laughs> The Bible says magi from the east came. We more traditionally refer to them as wise men or kings. Actually, they were a rather unique lot of men, probably from Persia, probably from a much greater number than just the three that we talk about. Traditional accounts, historical accounts dating back to the first century, actually put their number at 12. Magi were men who dabbled in astronomy, astrology, philosophy, medicine, natural science, and, of course, magic. The good magi would find themselves in the court of the king offering counsel to the rulers of the land. The not-so-good magi were really nothing much more than fortune tellers and sorcerers. It seems that this group, at least, was of the good noble variety because they were, after all, in search of this king of the Jews. Now, our text tells us that they came to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you understand, was the city of the kings. And if you're looking for a king, where would you look? You would look in the city of the kings. And so they arrived in Jerusalem, supposing that by this time, some 18 to 24 months after Jesus was born, that certainly someone in Jerusalem would know the whereabouts of this king of the Jews. The wise men said, we saw his star when it rose. I've got to stop there for just a moment. So much fascination has surrounded this star. It comes to the forefront every year at this time. There are astronomers who try to explain this phenomena. There are astrologers who have a heyday with this. There are scientists who have a variety of explanations. There are skeptics, of course, who try to just explain it away. And there are religious scholars who have their own opinions about what this star might have been. I hate to disappoint you, but I am not going to try to explain it because... I don't know. <laughs> However, I do know that the Bible says there was a star, and I believe that. I also know that this star was very unusual. If you put this whole story together, you realize that these wise men who were in the east saw this star rise, and they identified that this star was different. It was a new star. There was something unique about it, and after it first appeared, it seems as though that it actually then disappeared from sight. And so the wise men, you understand, made their way to Jerusalem because they figured that that's where the king would be. 
And when they got to Jerusalem and they inquired about the king's whereabouts, at first nobody had the slightest idea, well, especially Herod, about the star or the child. But then they found out and they made their way from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, as we'll read in just a moment. And it seems that at that point the star reappeared to them and that it guided them on their five- or six-mile journey from Herod's palace to Joseph, Mary, and Jesus' house. It's kind of interesting. First of all, stars don't go north and south, which that would have been. They go east and west. Besides that, I've never really known a star that guides people or comes to stop over someone's house. (laughs) I mean, I can't explain it to you. I just know what happened, and it was unusual. God orchestrated this in his divine plan to lead the wise men to Jesus. Now, notice the wise men said, we have come to worship him. That's pretty amazing. Wise men, nobility, people who were total heathens, total pagans, they came to worship Jesus. Literally, the word worship here means to fall down and pay homage to him. Let's pick it up with verse 3, verses 3 through 6. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So verse 3 says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Well, let me offer an opinion here. I believe the reason that Herod was disturbed and the reason that Jerusalem was disturbed are two different reasons. Herod was disturbed because this newborn king, Jesus, was a threat to his throne. Jerusalem was disturbed because as this news spread about this, they were thinking, Is it possible that this could be the deliverer? Is it possible that we could be free finally from Roman occupation and oppression? Well, Herod knew enough about Judaism that he put two and two together. He called together all the chiefs, priests, and the teachers of the law. By the way, I'm going to stop here and, and, and just say, the wise men, they never said anything about Messiah. Did you notice that? But Herod knew enough that this could be the Christ. And so he called together the Jewish religious leaders and he inquired of them where the Messiah, the Christ, was to be born. He should have known that, being of Jewish heritage himself. But they looked up Micah 5 and verse 2 and they pointed to the answer. Bethlehem. Look at verses 7 and 8 with me. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. So why did Herod call the Magi secretly? Well, I think I know why. Because there wasn't a person in Jerusalem who knew wicked Herod who would have believed this this story. Those who knew him knew there wasn't the slightest chance in the world that his motives were pure. He never did have any any integrity from day one of his rule. And so he called the wise men who didn't know him so well. Secretly, he found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. Why did he do that? Well, because he wanted to determine the exact time that Jesus was born. Why? Because later on in Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, he used that very same information to slaughter all of the baby boys in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas that were two years of age and under. He was hoping to snuff out the life of this king who was a threat to Herod's own throne. And he tells the wise men, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Yeah, right, King Herod. Mm -hmm. 
And so we go to verses 9 and 10. Look at it with me. They had heard the king. They went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them. It reappeared until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were over. Joyed. And so this star appeared to guide them. The wise men were overjoyed, well, because this told them that their journey was not in vain, that their relentless seeking was about to be rewarded, finally. Look at verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I suggest again that that's an amazing response for a heathen nobleman who did not have the scriptures or the spiritual heritage that the Jews had. By the way, doesn't it bother you? that the Jews who had the scriptures, who had these prophecies, who were even the ones to answer the question about where the Messiah was born, doesn't it bother you that they themselves never bothered to make this five to six mile journey to just check it out? I mean, that bugs me. But the wise men made the journey. And in spite of their pagan ways, they did the only appropriate thing they bowed down and they worshiped Jesus. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, scholars have had a wonderful time <laughs> with these three gifts over the years. I mean, do they symbolize something? I don't know for sure. But let me share what they might symbolize, and you can take it for what it's worth. Gold, of course, is the most precious of metals. It is the metal that a king owns. And so this speaks of Jesus' reign, of his being the king. Frankincense was an incense that was used in worship, and so I think that speaks of Jesus' deity, of his divinity. And then myrrh, interestingly enough, was used in an embalming. And so prophetically speaking, this spoke of why Jesus came. He is the Savior. He was born for the purpose to die. Well, that brings us to verse 12. Look at it with me. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Well, God intervenes one more time and in order to warn the wise men not to play into Herod's scheming hand. Well, let's look at the scripture. Now, what lessons can we learn from this familiar story? Let me suggest three simple lessons that we can apply to our lives from the story of the wise men today. And these lessons all have to do with seeking. The first one is, I see a lesson here about inconvenience to self. Inconvenience to self. You can't read the story of the wise men without realizing that they made this trek from Persia to Jerusalem and ultimately to Bethlehem at a great inconvenience to themselves. There was a price that they had to pay. There was a cost of time. I mean, this trip took them four years, at least, round trip journey. There was a cost in family. Custom was that in such a perilous journey as this, in a lengthy journey like this, that you would not take along the wife and children. And so they had separated themselves from their families for this time, most likely. There was a cost in money. This was a very expensive trip to take. And there was a cost in treasures, of course, as they gave their gold frankincense, and myrrh. All of which leads me to say this. Often when we seek to follow Jesus, there is a price to be paid. There's a cost to our discipleship. In fact, Jesus himself put it this way, Luke 14, verses 26 and 27. Let's read these verses out loud together. Would you read them with me? Anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self, can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow me can't be my disciple. Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. Yeah. 
choosing to follow Jesus often comes at a great inconvenience to self. Face it, it's inconvenient to get up and go to church and not sleep in, stay home, especially on a cold day like this, and watch football or something. It's inconvenient to get up a bit earlier every morning of the week in order to spend some time alone with God in His Word and in prayer. It's inconvenient to be a faithful steward of our financial resources by giving the first and the best, the tithe, to God. It's inconvenient to carve out time in our busy schedules to gather with other Christians in a midweek small group Bible study or life group. It's inconvenient to give our time and energy to serving and ministry in the church. It's inconvenient to take a public stand for Jesus when others around us don't share the same morals and values that we do. Jesus summed it up this way, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Yes, following Jesus is inconvenient and difficult, but it is worth it. Amen? Amen. Uh, that's a pretty good response. Let's try that again. It's worth it. Amen? Ah, yeah. oh, that's much, much better. All right. Number two, I see here a lesson about interference from others. Interference from others. The wise men encountered a bit of interference as they sought to find the Messiah. First of all, from Herod, who, of course, was just flat out opposed to Jesus. But also from the Jews, who were indifferent to Jesus and certainly weren't of any help it seems, to them finding him. Here's a lesson for us. Often in seeking to follow Jesus, we encounter interference from others. Sometimes that interference comes from government. More and more we're finding that to be true in our own country. It's certainly true overseas. We have so many brothers and sisters who actually are, are being tormented and tortured and imprisoned, some of them even giving their lives as martyrs for their faith in Jesus Christ. That's going to become increasingly true here in the United States in these end times. We will be persecuted more than you realize in the very near future. Interference from government. Then there's also interference from religion. False teachers within the church and certainly religions and cults outside of the church. Those who demand their freedom of religious expression. Even the Good News Club over across the street has already begun to uh, experience some opposition. You might have read about the story in Tehachapi where the Satanist group actually rose up and said, well, if you're going to allow a Good News Club on your campus, then you've got to allow a Satanist to come in and have a club for the kids as well. Kind of scary. Hasn't reached us here yet, but you need to be aware of that and be praying against that. There's opposition and interference. There's interference, of course, in our own lives from our jobs and our careers. More and more people are having to work on Sundays. More and more people are, are under the demand to take work home with them and to work overtime. Sometimes work, Sometimes career just gets in the way. You know, we're so busy with our work and our career that we don't have time for Jesus in our lives. We're too tired. Then there's interference from family and friends, ridicule, misunderstanding. I already heard a story right here in our own congregation of a family this year that they chose they're going to meet at 10 o'clock on Christmas Sunday morning for their family Christmas. And and one of our members here pleaded and said, can we do it later than that? Can't we do it after lunch? I want to go to church on Sunday. Well, that's your problem. Nobody else in this family goes to church. And so they're having to make a decision between do I go be with my family on Christmas Sunday or am I going to be in church? And I just encourage them as I would encourage you, make the right decision because God always honors obedience. Jesus warned us in John chapter 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged in the world, that world will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And so pursuing Jesus sometimes, oftentimes in fact, results in interference 
from others. Number three, I see here a lesson about intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. If we don't learn anything else from the story of the wise men, please, please, please let us learn that the Magi were not content to know about Jesus from a distance. They had to know Jesus up close and personal. At a great inconvenience to self and in the face of interference from others, the wise men were willing to do whatever it takes to find intimacy with God. And that's the bottom line, isn't it, of Christmas? We must all individually and personally get to know Jesus. Christmas is about God coming to earth in human flesh so that he could build a relationship with us. Christmas means nothing at all if we follow from a distance. It's not enough to know about Jesus. We must know Jesus. Someday, this same Jesus who was born as a baby, lived a perfect life, died and rose again, and now reigns with God on high. Someday, this same Jesus is going to come to take home with him those who truly know him and have trusted him individually and personally and intimately as the forgiver and the leader of their lives. I heard a story about a young man who graduated from high school and went off to college. Good young man. He was raised in the church all of his life, good godly parents. When he got to college, his roommate was a Christian. He was delighted by that, and his roommate said, you want to go to church with me this Sunday? He was a local boy. And so he said, well, sure, I'll go to church with you. So they went to church together, <clears throat> and he sat through the service, a great service, good preaching, everything was great. Uh, they were on their way out the back door, and the pastor was standing at the back door shaking hands and um, shook hands with the two young men. And when he came to this new kid who had been from out of town, first time in church that Sunday at this church, uh, he shook his hand, but he kind of hung on to the boy's hand, and he looked him square in the eye. And he said to this young man, Do you know Jesus? kind of bothered the young man. He went home that afternoon, and he called his parents and got his mom and dad on the phone and he said, the, the, told him the story. He said, the pastor looked me in the eye and said, do you know Jesus? And his dad said, well, did you tell him about our family heritage and how your parents are prominent leaders in the home church that you went to? And he said, dad, that's not what he asked me. He asked me, do you know Jesus? Well, did you tell him that you've gone to church every Sunday since you were but a week old? Did you tell him that you've memorized all these scripture verses when you were in Sunday school? Did you tell him how many times that you've actually read through the Bible? And he said, Dad, that's not what he asked me. He asked me, do you know Jesus? Well, did you tell him how you've served in various ministries in the church? And did you tell him about all those mission trips that you went on when you were in youth group? And he said, Dad, it's not what he asked me. He asked me, do you know Jesus? You see, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. The Apostle Paul put it this way, Philippians 3 and verse 10. Let's read this one out loud together. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him. That's it right there. It's not about religion, all that inferior stuff. It's about relationship, to know Christ personally, to experience, to be a partner, to go all the way with him. Someday, each and every one of us will stand before God, and the one and the only question that will matter is, do you know Jesus? Again, the wise men were not content to just know about Jesus. They wanted to know him personally, to experience him, to be a partner with him, to go all the way with him. Is that you? Are you all in today? Three lessons then from the story of the wise men and their seeking Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, and Lord. A lesson about inconvenience to self about interference from others, and about intimacy with God. As we are searching and looking 
and pursuing and hunting and chasing and tracking down Jesus. Let us realize that our decision to follow Christ will come at an inconvenience to self with interference from others and from our own intimacy with God. Portraits of Christmas. This morning we've looked at a portrait of seeking the wise men. As the old adage says, wise men still seek him. Watch this. Let's pray. Help us to realize how true that is, O Lord. That wise men still seek you. Life is all about running after you. It's all about our relentless pursuit of you. We are, every one of us, seekers, just like the wise men. I pray that we would never stop looking, that we would never stop studying, that we would never stop researching, that we would never stop meeting together to talk about your word and about what we're learning and how we're growing and what it means for our lives. I pray that as we go into this new year ahead that, that, that it would be all about just, just running after you with everything we've got. For wise people always, always seek you. Help us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name.